In this video, we'll provide a very brief review of signals. This video is intended for undergraduate students, and the assumption is that the students have already taken a course on linear systems and signals, and this video is just a brief rehash of the ideas that they already know. So let's begin by asking ourselves, how should you think of signals in signal processing? Now, one thing to keep in mind, which is something that I think many undergraduate students struggle with, is that the language of signal processing is abstract mathematics. And so we have to think of signals in mathematical terms, although we have already seen what do signals mean in real world. Now, why do we have to think of signals in abstract mathematics? Because the power of abstraction allows us to apply the same signal processing techniques to different phenomena. As long as the phenomena share same mathematical properties. And so the value is that just like when you are young and you learn addition, you learn 2 plus 3 equals 5, and that did not have anything to do with whether it's two oranges or two apples or two dollars. It's the same concept that we have to apply to the mathematics of signal processing. <clears throat> so what is a signal mathematically in signal processing? Well, it is nothing but a function of one or more independent variables, and the function takes either real or complex values. So here are some examples. An example of 1D signal. It's x of t. It's a signal that is a function of one independent variable. Now the real world example of that is for example speech, music, animal sound. As I am speaking, let's say a microphone is recording that information and there is some electrical current in response to what I am saying, that current is varying as a function of time. So that's x of t. One independent variable, one value. You can also talk about 2D signals. Signals are functions that are functions of two independent variables. For example, you can think of temperature as a function of horizontal and vertical coordinates. So you could think of temperature in this, for example, room according to horizontal and vertical coordinates. Now, <clears throat> you can also think of 3D signals. Again, you could think of temperature as a function of horizontal and vertical coordinates. For example, you are <clears throat> measuring temperature on the surface of the Earth in some region, let's say United States. But you also want to keep track of that as a function of time. Now you have three variables, for example, longitude and latitude data and time. Now most undergraduate classes focus only on 1D or 2D signals. And that's just the nature of the undergraduate classes. As you go up, take more advanced classes, go to graduate school, you'll be dealing with actually multi-dimensional signals that could take on more than one, that, that could be function of many variables, and they could also themselves take more than one value. So they could be vector-valued signals. But at the undergraduate level, we talk mostly about 1D or 2D signals. And then as a convention, we call the variable in 1D signals as time. It is important for you to know that that is just an abstraction. That independent variable could be any other thing. For example, you could be talking about, let's think of a thin strip. You are measuring temperature. You are thinking of how the temperature varies on this thin strip. And so now the independent variable is the location. So now it's distance. But all the theory that we develop for 1D signals, while we are calling that variable time, would be applicable to that setting. Now, one other thing that I talked about, and that I know confuses many undergraduate students, <coughs> is the concept of complex valued signals. What is a complex valued signal? Well, again, this is just an abstraction to make our lives easier. 
And I know some of you might be having a chuckle that how could complex numbers be making our lives easier? But that is the reality. The abstraction of complex numbers makes dealing with sinusoids, for example, very easy. Now, the way you should think of complex numbers is nothing more than a, 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 an ordered pair of real numbers. You have two numbers, A and B. You write a complex number A plus JB, and that is this number A plus JB, that I could just write in terms of A, B, an ordered pair. The only thing is that we have, for this ordered pair, we have also defined a rule for multiplication. So a complex number is effectively a scalar with two dimensions. You can think of it as sitting in this two-dimensional Euclidean space. So we use different terms for it. We use z-plane, we use complex plane. It's just a two-dimensional plane. Now, complex numbers are really useful, especially in engineering, to help us deal with sinusoidal functions. Why is that the case? Remember, sinusoids have two degrees of freedom. We can talk, for example, we could say two cosine of pi by four. That's a sinusoid. It has two degrees of freedom. One is amplitude, two. The other is phase, pi by four. So you either have to talk about magnitude phase or you could combine that information in just one complex number. For example, Again, taking the example of if I have two pi by cosine of pi by four, so this is this is two, right? And I go up, and I have this pi by four angle that I make. Okay. So what I see is that this complex number, which corresponds to 2 e to the j pi by 4, tells me both the magnitude and the phase, and, and the real value of that, real value of this thing, which is this value, I drop a tangent, which is this number, is the cosine part of this. Now, I'm sure you have seen many examples where you the analysis using sinusoidal functions using complex numbers becomes much, much easier. So again, we are not going to go into too much details, but I just want to remind you that complex numbers are really there to help us in our analysis. It's an abstraction of a scalar with two degrees of freedom. Now, if you are given a complex valued signal x of t, what that means is it's <coughs> effectively two functions, a t plus j b t. And what the way you should think of it is that effectively you are talking about two interlinked signals, a t and b t, two functions, a t and b t, that don't interfere with each other. One is the the horizontal axis, the other is the vertical axis or g-axis. And these complex value signals actually are, arise in many electrical engineering applications. You already get uh, familiar with them in your circuit analysis courses, but they also arise in communications. There, we think of them as I and, so if you ever do take communications course, you will learn about I and Q modulation or quadrature modulation. They arise in radar, they arise in MRI, and many other applications. Now, let's talk about two broad classes of 1D signals in the mathematical sense. The first class is that of continuous time signals. Now, going forward, I'm only going to talk about 1D signals. <coughs> in a continuous time signal, the independent variable takes a continuum of values. That's what we mean by a continuous time signal. So the example is, if x of t is a continuous time signal, it is only true if the independent variable, it's a statement about the independent variable. If t exists on some continuous interval and x of t is defined on that continuum, for example, sound. 
Now, an example of this is you have, so let's say this is your t-axis. Again, as I said, this is just an abstraction. And your signal is defined for all values of t. So pick any value, let's say this is minus 10, and let's call this 10. Pick any value of t between minus 10 and 10. So t belongs to minus 10 and 10. Pick any value in these two regions and you have a defined value of x of t. That's a continuous time signal defined on a continuum of independent uh, variable. In contrast to the continuous time signal, we have what's called discrete time signals. Now, discrete time signals, again, it's a statement about independent variables. So a discrete time signal is one in which the independent variable takes only a discrete set of values. So an example is that Xn is a discrete time signal if it is only defined for some values of n. And without loss of generality, we call that, for example, the set of all in positive and negative integers, n equal to 0, plus, minus 1, plus, minus 2. For example, you could be collecting data about the prices of houses in the United States. Now, there are only a discrete number of houses. You can give each house a number, 0 up to whatever is the maximum number of houses. That's a discrete time signal. Again, time is just an abstraction. There is no notion of time in this problem that I described, but it is still a discrete time signal in the parlance of signal processing. Now, an important thing to keep in mind is that if we define our independent variable to be n equal to 0, plus, minus 1, and so forth, then saying x 0.3 actually makes no sense mathematically because the signal is not even defined for n equal to 0 0.3. It's not that x 0 0.3 is 0. The signal is not defined there. So if you take this example, you have basically, you put down different values of n and you have n equal to 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, minus 1, minus 2, minus 3, and you assign different values. And as I said, you cannot talk about n equal to 0 0.3 because if I go there, the signal is not even defined. It is not 0, it is not defined. Now one final word of caution, the terminology we use x of t. Typically, these parentheses are used to, to convey to the reader that we are talking about continuous time signals. These square parentheses are used to convey to the reader that we are talking about discrete time signals. The variables in here, n and t, don't matter as much. Now, you can further do classification of 1D signals. The terminology of continuous time and discrete time signals, it's really a statement about the independent variables. We have not said anything about the values that the signal takes. But if you talk about the values of the signal, then some people in the profession make further, classifi uh, further classification of 1D signals. For example, one classification is people reserve the name analog signals. So one is continuous time signals, but analog signals is when the continuous time signals takes values on a continuum also. And the example is sound. So analog signal is one where not only that independent variable takes uh, values on a continuum, but also the function itself takes values on a continuum. Similarly, for discrete time signals, we can talk about digital signals, which is the case when not only the discrete time signal, the, the discrete time signal's independent variable takes values on a, finite, uh, on a finite set of values, but also the values that the signal takes are also from a finite set. 
The, an example of that is a recorded MP3 song. In your computer, if you have a 16-bit or 32-bit computer, you only have to do the 32 different values that each bit can take. So here are some then distinctions. We have, on one hand, we have analog signals in the world of continuous signals. So this is an analog signal. And we also can have, for example, continuous time signals, but they themselves take only a discrete set of values. So again, you will notice that your signal is defined for all values of t, but the values it takes, for example, let's call this 2 and this 1 and this minus 2, the values it takes are only 3. Similarly, in the world of discrete time signals, you can have signals that themselves take only discrete values. So you could only, you take values only on n equal to 0, 1, 2, and the values you take are only a discrete set. Minus 1, minus 2. So this is a digital signal then. On, as opposed to a discrete signal that is allowed to take any values. Of course it takes values on a discrete set. But it can itself take any value. And similarly, this is an analog signal. So these are two broad classification of signals that we should keep in mind, which is, first of all, what is a continuous time and a discrete time signal? Again, time is just an abstraction. And then within that, we can talk about whether the values that these signals take are on a continuum or a fixed set and then we talk about analog and digital signals. And signals can be more than 1D, but at most undergraduate level, we focus only on 1D, perhaps 2D signals.